Hi everyone, my name is Belinda Sheary and I'm a General Practitioner in Sydney, Australia. I have a special interest in TSW and have been seeing patients in my practice with this condition since 2015. I've also researched TSW and published a few papers on the topic in the last few years. Let's start by talking about TSW definitions. There isn't a whole lot in the literature about TSW because it's poorly acknowledged, but there are now two systematic reviews. The first was published in 2015 and the most recent one earlier this year. They both came to very similar conclusions. For those that might not know, a systematic review is a study where the researchers look at all the previous papers published on a topic and basically summarise the data. With TSW, this unfortunately creates a problem as patients from very different populations are lumped together, leading to conclusions that are not necessarily applicable to many TSW patients. So in the most recent review, the authors stated, TSW usually occurs after prolonged use of moderate to high intensity topical steroid usage, usually on the face. It is most common in women and many patients present due to improper use, such as for cosmetic reasons. Symptoms include erythema, itchiness and burning. Secondary lesions are commonly scales. I've highlighted and read there the words that make this definition inappropriate for the patients that I see. And here you can see why this conclusion is not applicable to patients in Western countries. The systematic review examined a total of 11 studies on TSW from 2016 to 2020, which included a total of 394 patients. However, 316 patients were from a single study in India, where 83% of the patients were female, and every patient had used topical steroids for cosmetic purposes. The patients I see have all been prescribed topical steroids, and they almost always have eczema as their original skin diagnosis. So they are a very different group of people to those described in this Indian study. I believe our definition of TSW needs to acknowledge the two very different TSW populations, those that have misused topical steroids for cosmetic purposes and those who have been prescribed topical steroids. I define TSW as a potential adverse effect of topical steroid overuse, typically seen in patients who report having used increasing amounts and or potencies of topical steroids over time. Where topical steroids have been prescribed, it's most often seen in patients with atopic dermatitis or eczema. In parts of Asia and Africa, TSW is more commonly seen in women who have misused topical steroids for skin lightening. After stopping their use of topical steroids, affected patients develop new features that are not associated with their original skin condition. What is actually happening to the skin in TSW? Unfortunately, as you might expect for a condition which is poorly recognised, there's been very little research into the mechanisms of TSW symptoms. Here are three papers that have looked at it. The first paper here was published in 1991, and they found that patients stopping long-term topical steroid use had reduced water content in the top layer of the skin. This can explain the scaling, peeling skin, and the dryness. In 2006, Marvin Rappaport published this paper where he studied the role of nitric oxide causing blood vessels to dilate excessively in TSW, which explains the red skin and the swelling seen. Moto Fukaya found prolonged use of topical steroids probably suppresses the skin's production of cortisol. And so when a person who has used topical steroids long-term stops using them, they have a relative cortisol insufficiency, which would lead to some of the TSW symptoms. When I first meet a patient concerned about TSW, usually the first question they will ask me is whether I think they have TSW. The answer isn't straightforward because there are no diagnostic criteria for TSW. In this paper I wrote in 2018, I proposed some diagnostic criteria and I'd like to go through those with you now. I suggested we should consider topical steroid withdrawal when the following essential criteria are fulfilled the diagnosis becoming more likely when more of the key diagnostic criteria are also present. So the essential criteria for a typical case of TSW, you'll see a history of long-term regular topical steroid use, so months to years, where the topical steroids were initially effective, but over time either increased amounts or potencies or both were required to reduce the severity of skin symptoms. Itch, occasionally itch is mild, but I find it's always present and often it is very severe. The erythema or the redness, so this is the widespread red skin, the spreading areas of redness. Key diagnostic criteria. So the first three here cover the history. 
So a history of atopy, especially atopic dermatitis, is extremely common. Asthma and hay fever are also common, as is a history of food allergies. A history of using topical steroids for the face, especially potent topical steroids, is common. A history of using oral prednisone for skin symptoms is far more commonly seen in the TSW population compared to the general eczema population. Burning pain is classic. Skin sensitivity to previously tolerated skin products can be seen, as can a sensitivity to water, so people may choose to limit their bathing or showering for a time. Excessive skin peeling, so the shedding, oozing skin, the swelling, the elephant wrinkles, and the red sleeve sign. Here you can see the thickened skin with reduced skin elasticity to the backs of the elbows and the knees there. With the red sleeve, you can see the redness to the arms ending abruptly at the wrist, and you have a very sharp demarcation between the clear skin of the palms and the red skin there of the forearms. On the side of the hand here, you've got the redness here ending very abruptly and the clear skin on the side of the hand. This patient demonstrates the diffuse redness of skin, the swelling of the ankle and the sharp demarcation between the affected and unaffected skin. This patient demonstrates the scaling skin, again a very sharp demarcation between the affected skin and the clear skin. This patient is Asian and he has more of a brown discoloration to his skin, but still a very sharp demarcation between the clear skin and the affected skin. This patient has a papular postular version of TSW at this point. And you can see her lesions end very abruptly there on the side of the foot. Additional supporting features which may be present in TSW. Sleep disturbance and mood disturbance are extremely common. Skin pain other than burning pain. So this includes all the nerve pain that some people experience. Papules and pustules. So this is the little skin bumps and pus spots that some people develop. The headlight sign. So this is where you have the red face with the clear skin to the nose. It's not specific for TSW, but was actually first described in eczema. Management of TSW. There's no specific management of TSW, and so we're focusing on symptom management, supportive care, and monitoring for complications. For lifestyle measures, many patients will try the ice and cool compresses for their burning pain. Loose cotton clothing might be worn due to the sensitive sore skin. Bandages and non-stick dressings might be used for the oozing areas. I put in brackets there moisturising. Patients will often find moisturising helpful in the early stages, but many prefer to stop using them a few months in. I've included diet, not because there's any particular diet that will help with skin healing, but rather that anecdotally many patients have reported to me their skin symptoms flare if they start eating a lot of junk food, fast food and drinking alcohol. So a healthy diet's always a good idea. Sunlight is often helpful in the later stages of TSW and presumably this works somewhat in the same way as the light therapy I've mentioned further down. With over-the-counter medications, many people will try antihistamines for itch and paracetamol and ibuprofen for pain. With prescription medications from your GP, patients sometimes want to try sleeping pills, but they don't seem to be particularly effective when symptoms are severe. Gabapentin has been described in the literature for burning pain and some patients might want to try prescription painkillers. But of course, these medications are for short-term use only. From a dermatologist or immunologist, patients might try cyclosporin or a similar oral immunosuppressant. Light therapy may help a bit. And Peter Leo has published a small case series of TSW patients who benefited from dupilumab. So that might also be an option for some people. Mental health, of course, is a huge issue in both TSW and severe eczema, and some patients might benefit from seeing a psychologist or trialling antidepressants. I thought I'd include some self-management strategies here from a qualitative study I published earlier this year. You can see there's a wide variety of activities people try. These are responses from just 19 people. The second question people seeing me about TSW usually ask is, how long will my symptoms last? This was something that interested me, so I designed this study a few years back and followed around 20 participants for two years to see how they got on. Unfortunately, the answer was it varies and it's complicated. So in this two year study, I had approximately 20 participants fill in questionnaires at seven points in time. 
and this included the Dermatology Life Quality Index. This is a series of 10 questions. If the patient scores low, so 0 to 1, it suggests their skin symptoms have no effect on their life. And if they score between 21 and 30, so 30 being the maximum score, it suggests their skin symptoms have an extremely large effect on their life. If you look over here at the average DLQI scores, you can see that they do come down consistently over the two year period. However, if you look over here at the ranges, you can see that they're really very large. And even here at the two year mark, we have six of the 19 participants who report their skin symptoms have no effect on their life. You still have three of the 19 participants who report their skin symptoms have a very large effect on their life. So I went back and looked at the scores of these participants earlier on in the study and they were in fact significantly lower. So this suggests that these three participants were experiencing a flare of their symptoms at the two year mark. So unfortunately you can't provide a clear picture to someone stopping long term topical steroid use as to how they're likely to be at any one point in time because as I said here in the heading it varies and it's complicated. Which brings me to the next point that I wanted to make. A very large proportion of people who stop using topical steroids due to TSW concerns do go back to using them again. From my research with admittedly small numbers, this seems to be around 30%, but I actually wonder if it might even be higher. There are people who resume using topical steroids within days, others within months, and I've met a number of patients now who have even restarted using topical steroids over two years after stopping. And these are patients who had a very difficult TSW symptoms initially, went on to have a period of relatively clear skin and with minimal symptoms, but unfortunately they experienced a flare of their symptoms. So this is a very difficult condition to manage. Some patients, of course, do decide to stop using topical steroids again. Seeking health care. If you're going to go to see your general practitioner about your skin and want to broach the topic of TSW, here are some resources you might like to print out and take with you. The first one here is an overview of the condition I wrote a few years back. And the one on the right is quite a recent one, so January 2021, put out by the National Eczema Society and the British Association of Dermatologists. And just a reminder, if you've been through TSW and are trying to avoid steroids unless absolutely necessary, they're not just prescribed for skin symptoms. Here are some doctors who may prescribe steroids in the form of tablets, injections, puffers, nasal sprays, eye drops, etc. Sometimes, of course, steroids are prescribed for very serious conditions and they can be life saving, so avoiding them might not be possible. But in some circumstances, you might be able to avoid, say, a steroid injection for a painful joint or for a tooth extraction. So if you are in the position to ask about options, this is worth doing. But again, steroids can be life saving and sometimes there really isn't a choice. Here are my references. Thank you for listening.